Hello, welcome to the Bridge Art Gallery Artist Conversation. I am Cheryl Mack. I co-own the Bridge Art Gallery with my husband, Christopher Mack. And we are very excited to um, welcome you to this wonderful art conversation. Uh, Bridge Art Gallery located in Bayonne, New Jersey. And in this temporary new normal, we are uh, hosting uh, virtual artist conversations, um, a way for our artist community to be able to continue to connect with one another um, and to be able to engage in the whole creative process. So uh, today I am very excited to welcome two of my all-time favorite artists. Um, I've known them for many years, um, but I, I could not be more thrilled uh, to welcome them. They're visiting us virtually from Atlanta. Let's welcome Grace Kisa and Maurice Evans. Hello there, family. Hey, hey, sir. How are you? I'm fine. I'm so excited to be able to do this artist conversation with you guys. We go way, way back. Yeah. Um, but it's not only, you know, because I think of you all as family, but you are two of the most creative artists um, that I know. Oh. And, um, and I have to honestly say that uh, Christopher and I, my husband, Christopher Mack, and I would not have the Bridge Art Gallery if it wasn't for you guys, if it wasn't for your encouragement, for your willingness to participate in that first initial art exhibition um, that we did and encouraged us along the way in our journey to actually open the Bridge Art Gallery. And your, your guidance and your support has just been endless and we are eternally grateful for those late night calls, early morning calls, midday calls and FaceTimes just to get your insight and your encouragement. So I, I just wanna start by saying thank you and I appreciate you and love you guys dearly. Oh, we love you too and thank you for opening up the galleries. I think it's very cool. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's been an incredible journey. Um, we always, uh, once we kind of started in this direction because you know, oftentimes you have visions of things that you wanna do for yourself and God says, hey, wait a minute. I want you to go down this lane and by us opening the Bridge Art Gallery, it's been a way for us to be able to highlight um, artists that we love um, and also to provide new opportunities for new and emerging artists. And it's such it's been such a rewarding experience being able to work with new artists and have them show in our gallery for the first time. And um, we could not you know, be more happy about that but also we strongly believe that art can be culturally educational. And we use you know, our platform with the Bridge Art Gallery to be able to showcase artists of color and be able to tell you know, our story, their stories, whether they're um, African and African-American, Hispanic, Indian, but there's so much that we can learn from each other through the expression of art. And so with that, I would love for you to share with our audience um, your journey of becoming an artist. Um, and we'll start with the queen herself, Queen Grace. Grace, if you can share with our audience like how your journey started as an artist. Okay, so my name is Grace Kisa. I am a Kenyan artist based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I have uh, always been an artist. So I did it from nursery school until today. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, have a great art education uh, living in Virginia, McLean, Virginia. We had Fairfax County uh, Public Schools had art and music. And so we had art and music all the way through uh, till we graduated. And uh, I ended up going to college, uh, going to art school in, in Atlanta uh, to study art. Um, after that, I worked uh, for, you know, I did a retail job right after college and then ended up working for an art distribution company where I painted. Um, Maurice ended up working with me there and uh, we worked there for a couple of years, learned a different aspect of the art business, the business of art, of selling original art. And after working there, we went out on our own, uh, started uh, exhibiting and selling our work. Um, 
So I've been doing it for over 20 years now, uh, working for myself, uh, independently through galleries, online, doing arts festivals and art fairs. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's how I got to, uh, uh, got to where I am now. Now I started out as a painter, a uh, photographer. Hold on, hold on. Where, where are you, Cheryl? We can't see you. Yes, I'm here. I want the audience to be able to see you in full color. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's easier to talk to someone. Yes. We're talking to ourselves. Right. You're right. not talking it's, to yourself. It feels, it feels yeah. a little weird. We need to see somebody. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm here listening actively. <laughs> but Grace looks so beautiful full screen. So I just wanted to share her beauty with our audience. <laughs> well, let me step out then. Let, go ahead. Go ahead and go full screen. It's a little, it's a little out there too, Maurice. <laughs> need to get in. So nah, she's, the she's the beautiful the one. Go ahead and do the full screen on the screen. So, uh, <laughs> So I was saying that I started out as a painter. Uh, I'm a printmaker, a photographer. I'm a member of the uh, African, African American collective of female photographers called Sistography. And I've been showing with them for the past probably about 20 years. Um, so all of that goes into my then development into a mixed media sculptor. Um, and all of that has been informed the work that I do today. Now, I have to admit that when we first met Grace, I saw your artwork and you were doing florals. Yes. And you were doing these amazing florals. And um, I think it was last year we did a solo show with your, or when we first did our first exhibition here in Bayonne, mm -hmm. you brought your artwork. And I was like, wait, what's this? This looks yeah. amazing. Like right. your ability to constantly expand yourself as an artist. And I think anyone who appreciates your work is always constantly surprised by the level of depth of your creativity. Like you're not just a, you know, kind of a, a one dimensional artist, mm -hmm. but you're so multi-dimensional. And I think that's, you know, for someone who, you know, appreciates you. That's the one thing that I, I always enjoy about your art, where it's like, oh, wait, okay, we're doing that. That's right. amazing and just mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, that's the fun part. I'm always, uh, curios curiosity is a big part of my creativity. So I'm always looking for different ways of articulating my ideas. And so I'm not limited to one medium. Um, even as a painter, I, I was a mixed media artist. So my sculpture would be the same. Okay. Well, King Maurice, tell us about your journey, my king. <laughs> You're trying to make me feel awkward. Uh, you know he's a little shy. So whatever. Uh, I've always been an artist. I, I can't remember when I wasn't an artist. So um, I've always liked drawing and painting and sketching and um creating music, doing film, doing photography. Um, I've always done it. So I did go to art school. Um, that's how the two of us met, was uh, at, art, at the Art Institute of Atlanta. And then um, after that, I did some, my degree was actually fashion illustration. Mm -hmm. Then I started doing commercial art right out of school. Um, end up doing some medical illustrations as well, right after school. And then um, started working with Grace. Uh, she told me about this place she was working at and and they was creating like uh, original works on paper and canvas and stuff like that. And so I started working there. And so um, that started my independent art journey. Right. And so I probably started working for myself around 94 and um, been doing it ever since since then. So, yeah. so, so as um, as two you know, extremely creative people that came out of the Art Institute of Atlanta um, and there have been so many other tremendously talented artists that have come out there. What made you take the leap of faith um, to no longer work for someone else and said, you know what? I, I believe in myself so much that I want to do this full time. 
Go ahead. Okay, so I was the first one to leave. Uh, even though I had gotten there first, I was there for probably about two or three years. And for me, it was like getting a master's degree in the business of art. Um, a lot of times when we go to art school, we're not taught about, we're taught about working for Coca-Cola or working for Turner or working for a corporation or an ad agency. And nobody has taught us about even the, even the whole market that I discovered uh, working for that company where they would supply corporations, uh, hospitals, hotels, interior design firms with art. Um, they would have trade shows uh, in New York I had never known about that until I started working for them. And so uh, after two or three years of working uh, in, their, in their warehouse, it was a warehouse studio, um, I was ready to leave. I thought I had learned um, what I could learn in that, in that place and move on to the next thing. So uh, boldly, <laughs> and uh, there's something to be said about you, 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 once you're gone, you're gone. You're like, yeah. And so uh, with my last little commission check, uh, I left and uh, the first couple of months, there was, there was nothing. Uh, luckily for me, I was also, I used to braid hair. So when I was in art school, that was how I bought my art supplies. Uh, I was able to fill, you know, uh, sometimes pay, supplement my rent uh, after, after graduating. Um, so I did that in the meantime until I found a dealer that started uh, carrying my work. So what was that process um, connecting with that first dealer that first said, you know, okay, I like your story. I love your art. Mm -hmm. uh, was it difficult to find that first dealer? You know, I was lucky enough that she, at the time, she was uh, wanted to do an Af African-American distribution version of the company that we worked for. And so she was looking for young Afri or just African-American artists, independent artists that she could hire to do the work and that she could sell in the same, uh, at the same art fairs that, that, that they would be selling their work. So I think she also had dealt with another older artist uh, who worked for the company that we worked for. And so it was an easy transition that he introduced her to, to us and we started uh, supplying her with the work. Okay, and so your um, establishment um, kind of venturing out, is that what gave you encouragement, Maurice, to kind of follow Grace's lead? Uh, well, yeah. So um, she was the first artist that I knew who had a solo show, right? So I watched that happen. I watched you know, she would be at my apartment and she would be working on her show. And I watch, I would, you know, watch her. She she would paint from sun up to sundown and sometimes around the clock, sometimes I mean literally, you know, twenty four hours will go by, she's still painting. And so, you know, and then I saw the show happen and then she did very well at the show. I said, Wow, okay, that's that's very cool. You know right. what I'm saying? So that was the first time that I knew someone personally do that. Mm -hmm. I heard of people doing it, mm -hmm. you know, but to to witness it, you know, was a was another thing. So it was encouraging for me. Mm -hmm. So well, you know, maybe I can try it, or you know, how do I get my my work started, right? So a, a, a lot of this is what well, was following her, um, looking at what she did. Like she she got our work in this particular gallery, and uh, she introduced me to them. And then I said, well, you know, can I put some of my work in? It? And they did. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took a while for it, it to sell, but it finally started happening. And I think it happened right after I did this uh, this poster for the city of Atlanta. It was the Atlanta Jazz Festival poster. Mm -hmm. Then after that, people started seeking me out, mm -hmm. and um, they started going to that gallery and purchasing work from there. So it kind of started from there. And then Grace was the one who encouraged me to do the National Black Arts Festival for the first time in '94. Mm -hmm. and so. Uh, that really helped kick off my career as well because I met a lot of people in the field. And then um, I actually used that money to go do a trade show in New York. So we went and did uh, Art Expo New York, you know, and then I met a whole nother group of people, mm -hmm. uh, gallery owners, uh, dealers, 
you know, some so they would buy work from me and resell it, uh, or they would represent me in their galleries or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how it started, mm -hmm. and um, just kept going from there. So yeah, that's how that happened. But yeah, mm -hmm. since since '94, we've been independent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So of course it's been just a well laid plan. No rocks, no dips, no dives, no hilltops, right? Not even close. <laughs> well, what's interesting is uh, there was no plan. Yeah. Because see, mm -hmm. you know, all of this is going on where, when um, this is not necessarily popular, right? Right. So right now it's nothing to say that hey, I'm 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 an independent mm -hmm. artist or. I work for myself or mm -hmm. I'm an influencer or mm -hmm. I'm a brand, mm -hmm. whatever, right? Mm -hmm. right? Back then it wasn't like that. It so it was no much thing. difficult. We didn't have um, social media like we have now, right? right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a bit scary. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it was more out of like a do or die sort of situation. Either, either you're going to make it or you're going to fail. Right. And so that was the inspiration, you know what I'm saying? So there really was no plan. It was like, okay, you know, if we don't do this, then this is, you know, we're going to, well, at least me, I'm going to be homeless. You know what I'm saying? So how do I sustain my lifestyle? You know, um, I learned enough from the place that we used to work mm -hmm. on how to sell, who to yes. sell to, yes. what people were looking for and stuff like that. And so- um, It really had to produce. Right. So because we, we painted yeah. eight hours a day every day. Mm -hmm. And so we could meet our den we it was nothing for us to meet our deadlines. We really knew that we had the discipline for, for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that experience working for um another artist was kind of your tutorial in the business side mm -hmm. of the artist. It wasn't an artist, it was it's an, a it's a, yes. it's an art company. It was an, an art company, okay. So, so they had different things that they sold as packages. So they had abstracts, landscapes, uh, figuratives, uh, impressionist, uh, impressionist paintings. Mm -hmm. So each one, sometimes they'd get an order for 1500. And so there were 10, at least 10 artists work, working to fill that order. Okay. So the order was, was filled and shipped out mm -hmm. or it would be a combination. Uh, 500 abstracts, uh, 200 landscapes, uh, 300 figurative, 300 still lives, and then each art, you know, each artist was assigned to fill that order. So you you address that experience and how it prepared you for the business side of artists, uh, being an artist. How did that experience help you as an artist outside of kind of looking at your artwork as a, a job in the sense that you would do it you know, eight hours a day, you know, painting as if you were going to work, but it did it impact you on a creative end as well? Uh, for me, it did. Um, so, you know, you have to be self-motivated mm -hmm. a lot as, a, as an artist. So we got that self-motivation from working for that company. So mm -hmm. it showed us how to structure everything, right? Mm -hmm. so, but at the same time, um, for me, at least, I'll speak for myself. I wanted to get past the feeling of art production. You know what I'm saying? And I just wanted to do uh, art pieces that spoke to me or conveyed a message or whatever. So I stopped working like that. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. it's sort of almost like assembly line yes. art, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so I wanted to get away from that and just um, deal with my ideas, uh, what I wanted to uh, speak about. So that changed, and then you had to Very figure nice. that out. But right. doing, like I said, doing the Black Arts Festival helped me over that hump because that's when I met people that was interested in, in art. Mm -hmm. my, and the kind of art that you were doing. The, right, the, t the type yes. of art that I was interested in doing was, mm -hmm. you know, what some people would consider Black art, right? Uh, so, or at least would appeal to black people, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I've always done abstracts. Mm -hmm. I've always done uh, all types of figurative work, mm -hmm. uh, lives. still lives, mm -hmm. all kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. right? and, and when we worked for that company, we were restricted in subject matter and color palette. 
So they would look at what was what were the colors that interior designers were using, and we were limited to those colors. Uh, subject matter as well. We couldn't do um, figures that necessarily were black at all, black or Latino or any ethnicity. It had to be just a, a simple, plain, mostly European uh, uh, figuratives. Uh, still lives were anything, abstracts were, were for everybody. And so when we went into the uh, black art market, we still, I still did abstracts because I love them. And a lot of people were introduced to abstracts, you know, for the first time buying, buying mine or Maurice's or my sister's. So this was really just, you know, just that freedom mm -hmm. to be able to put your own personality, your own thoughts, your own creativity into your, your own work. And then also seeing the reception of people who loved it, yeah. who had spoke to them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, uh, the black uh, art buying public was burgeoning at that time. I, I, we were coming in probably in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. We had already, um, were trying to, the middle class was growing and they were being exposed to, to, to buying art. Okay. And, so part of those uh, shows, they could see African American shows on TV where there was art in the background that they wanted to buy that work, and they wanted their houses to look to be a reflection of themselves. Now, I do remember a story that both of you all shared with me. I think it was the Art Expo mm -hmm. um, in New York. Can you tell us a little bit about like your early experiences with Art Expo, New York? Mm -hmm. What did I tell you? How <laughs> <laughs> um, one there was uh, in those early days um, doing your doing your art career that there were very few artists of color initially participating with the show, and that um, when you did participate, how everyone was kind of grouped together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even though you had very individual booths, you yes. actually created this cohesive cultural experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so back in the day, um, um, Art Expo New York is held at a place called the Jacob Javits Center in New York. And so it's a huge conven convention. Um, it's like artists from all over the world and art companies from all over the world and art buy buyers and dealers would come and see what was out there, what was available. Sometimes they would purchase or make orders or, hey, how can we represent you in the gallery? Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, um, you no, know, black folks have always had to do their own thing, right? And so, uh, Joseph Holston, William Tolliver, um, people like that. Uh, who else am I leaving out? Um, uh, Charles Bibbs, uh, Charles Bibbs, Paul, Paul Goodnight, Goodnight mm -hmm. right? They show close together, right? And so, it was like this little corner. Right when you walked into the to the, to the uh, expo, it was to the left, right? And it was like the section of all the black artists, in, you know, in one spot. Mm -hmm. A lot of dealers wouldn't even bother going to the rest of the festival. They go straight to the black section. Okay. Because that was their market. Mm -hmm. So that made it easier as, as opposed to going, you know, but trying to go up and down those aisles hundreds of hours trying to find the black artists here and there, you know, so now you can just find them in one area, right? And so um, they created that section. They did that. And, okay. and it became an issue actually a little later. Art Expo, uh, some of the artists and other vendors started complaining and they wanted that section because the black artists made that section popular. Right. And so it was, I, I remember there was a big to do about that where um, they almost had to boycott the show and all kind of stuff was going on because the, the, the artist was like, listen, we built this section up. We want to be able to, we want first dibs at this section. Why mm -hmm. kind of, you know, give it, give it to someone else. So mm -hmm. the Art Expo was being gentrified. It was gentrified. That's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say. That's what was happening. Mm -hmm. right. So, yeah, you know, we had, you know, we saw a lot of things like that. Even the idea of there being a black arts and national black arts festival, mm -hmm. a lot of the white festivals, uh, predominantly white festivals, um, had a quota or did not accept uh, black art. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't think that their clientele would 
fight. I don't know what, what the, re the reasoning was. Mm -hmm. And so uh, black artists got together. Uh, I remember the, um, uh, the first one and it was in Atlanta, Georgia and people came from all over the country. And then eventually people were coming from the Caribbean, from Africa, from Canada, from uh, London to come to the National Black, Black Arts Festival. It was a uh, biennial, it would happen every two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why it was there was because we were being cut out of the regular fairs. You know, I, you know, I'm definitely very familiar with the National Black Arts Festival. I think I was a part of the team that did the first uh, gathering of colors in Centennial Park um, as a kickoff and fundraiser for the National Black Arts Festival. And it was just such an amazing experience to see artists from all over the world that looked forward to coming to Atlanta. Atlanta, of, you know, the Mecca of, you know, when you think about, you know, our culture uh, mm -hmm. and to be able to see the manifestation across the arts, um, you know, music, visual, dance, theater, um, and to have all that creativity and the vibrations of our people um, there in the city at the time. Um, and I, I know you both have participated with the festival and have been highlighted in different ways, um, rightfully so, because you are a part of you know, Atlanta's um, art fabric. So you know, we talked about your initial art journey um, and some of your experiences. Do you feel like your past experiences have set the stage for this new project that you're working on? And if you can share a little bit about how about the new project, its name, and how um, it's all come together. Great. Great. <laughs> we'll go to you. <laughs> you me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why. But uh, so like like we well i don't know if we explained it we worked together at the at the, the initial spot mm -hmm. and um working side by side with someone for eight hours a day you're bound to start conversations mm -hmm. right and and grace being from africa she's you know it's from nairobi uh come back on the screen sure it's a little weird yeah. and so um <laughs> So, so, so anyway, um, you know, I had a lot of questions, you know, like, Hey, you know, uh, what is the culture like there? You know, what do you guys do? And, you know, um, I had, I was curious about everything. Like, tell me everything, you know, what's the language, you know, uh, where, where are your people from exactly? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. well, we have those kind of conversations and, you know, I think I made a mistake one day and said, you know, black people right and when i was saying black i was you know coming from the african-american perspective when, when when i say black i'm talking about black people all over the globe right mm -hmm. she, she responded saying i'm not black and i was like what what are you talking about you're not black of course you're black she said mm -hmm. no i'm african and i'm like it's the same thing she's like no it's not the same thing i'm like well okay explain right and so, you know, she was saying that, hey, you know, we are pure, we're African. Our, our bloodlines haven't been diluted or, no, or hers at least, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, all right, I'll go with that. You know what I'm saying? And so when I explored it even more, I was like, well, technically she's right. You know what I'm saying? We, we you know, African-Americans tend to come from the, the west coast of Africa, we were brought here during slavery, a lot of us, not all of us, but a lot of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were mixed in with other cultures, right? Right. Bloodlines, they stripped of us of our own culture, our own languages, and then blended all these Africans together that didn't know each other's culture or language, mm -hmm. right? So because of that, they had to uh, find a way to, to create a whole new one, mm -hmm. right? And so now fast forward you know 400 years right um they have evolved into i feel a new group species type of african mm -hmm. tribe or whatever you want to call it right mm -hmm. um, but 
And so I, I can see that everywhere. I can see that in South America. I can see it in, in, the, in, the, in the Caribbean islands. I can see it wherever Black people were. Mm -hmm. um, they looked African to me. You know what I'm saying? And because again, genetics are so strong, you, it's, you can't deny that they're African, right? Even though you can tell they, they have other things in them, but clearly they're from Africa, right? And then uh, I think uh, even Grace would freak out sometimes when she would see someone and be like, hey, are they from so-and-so? So I said, I don't think so. I think they're from here, right? Mm -hmm. Michael asked them, they're like, oh yeah, we're from Florida. And Grace is like, oh my goodness, you look just like the such such a tribe and such such a land and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and I'm like, of course, because we're from Africa, right? Mm -hmm. right. And, um, and then for us, we, on a subconscious level, have maintained some things, mm -hmm. right? Um, we don't even know what we're doing, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it's in our food, sometimes it's in our, our language, um, uh, uh, how we dress, mm -hmm. right? Um, how we connect with one another instinctively. Right, mm -hmm. right. And so even, uh, I, I can tell you a funny story, like even um, things like making it rain, right? Mm -hmm. so I remember Grace was, you know, looking at this whole stripper culture, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yo, these dudes are just throwing, you know, bundles of cash in the air. It's like they're trying to impress each other or whatever they're doing, you know what I'm saying? Trying to pay the women. And she's like, you know, that comes from Africa. I was like, come on now, what are you talking about? Because Grace is always on, you know that started in Africa, right? You know? <laughs> she's like, listen, um, in our culture, what we do is uh, some, a lot of times you see that weddings, you know, like that, mm -hmm. or, or births or, or, or whatever, um, or, or performances. If they're happy with your performance or happy with something you're doing, they will either pin money on you mm -hmm. or they literally and ball it up and, put it and throw it at you, mm -hmm. right? It's a sign of approval, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes you see that weddings, they'll go up to the bride and start pinning money to a dress, right? So that whole making it rain literally comes from Africa, but we don't know that. Mm -hmm. We think it's hip hop culture, but it's, mm -hmm. it's it's not, it's African culture. Even right. the ritual of pouring liquor for the ancestors. You know, mm -hmm. they pour one for the homies. Right. That's straight from, from home. Right. Mm -hmm. The ones that aren't here. Yes. So, so with that being said, yeah. you know, um, uh, and this kind of happened by, sort of, sort of by mistake. You know, we was doing a shoot for a, a line of bangles that I had created. And one of my friends had seen the initial shoot that I did for it. She's like, well, it's cool, but it's missing something. It's not, you know, it's, it's missing something. So she's like, well, why don't you just have the models be naked and the only thing they have on is, are the bangles. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, that's cool. She's, and so she's like, matter of fact, I'll model for you. I was like, great. So she came through and um, Grace did her makeup and she did some really interesting things on her neck, you know, mm -hmm. all kind of interesting things. And then we put the bangles on her and we did the shoot. And I was looking at her and she's from South Georgia. I'm like, wow, you know, she looks, you know, very African to me, right? Mm -hmm. So Grace's mom had sent her all these wraps from home, right? I said, Grace, can you, would you put one of those wraps on her? You know, I just want to see what it looks like. And so she put it on her and I was like, that's what I'm talking about. She mm -hmm. looks like an African. She's, mm -hmm. you know, she, we couldn't tell her, we couldn't tell that she was from South Georgia or she was from right. uh, Senegal or South Africa. We wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. And so that sparked the idea of let's do a series of, of these shoots like this, right? Where we're going to take women that are uh, from the diaspora mm -hmm. and put them in these situations of uh, this regal look like a queen mm -hmm. and, uh, and this warrior look, yeah. right? And they were kind of symbolic for other things, mm -hmm. right? And it was to show that um, we, we are Africans mm -hmm. and you can't deny us, 
right? Even though a lot of us don't know it ourselves, and some of it, uh, some of us deny it ourselves. But if you are aware, you know that it's not true. You know what I'm saying? I can look at you and, and we can see it, right? And so that's kind of sparked the idea. And Sue's so like, well, you know, let's do this thing. And so, man, about 30 models later, you know, uh, we, we talked about doing a book and it's like, well, how can we, you know, take this on the road? So we thought about doing a show, a book and music. So yeah, the project is called New African. So the, yes. and, and so I named these women, the New Africans. Okay. Right. And so, uh, so yeah, and that's what the project is called as well. So what makes this, um, different than any of the other projects that you and Grace have worked on, you know, individually. And this is your first time collaborating, correct? On a long-term project. Mm -hmm. So we worked on this project for a decade, for 10 years now. Uh, we shot uh, over eight years, well, over eight years ago, we started shooting uh, these 40 women, 35, 35 women. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we didn't do it seamlessly. In the, in the, in the beginning, we started with, like 20 and then things happened. Uh, we had some health pro well, I had some health problems and then we ended up going back to uh, going back to the project. So uh, for me, who's uh, originally from Kenya, living in the diaspora for over 30 years, um, I'm somehow in between. I'm in between the continental and the, so as a third culture kid. So I grew up in Kenya, Ethiopia, Botswana, Toronto, Canada, McLean, Virginia, and Atlanta, Georgia. So, but I've always been Kenyan. So mm -hmm. when we lived in McLean, Virginia, in the summer, we would go to Kenya. So we were always in between uh, traveling back and forth. Uh, so that gave me the language of um, addressing these women in these costumes, drawing from my, uh, my African roots, and then making it uh, timeless uh making it adapting it to the new the new age but the fabric for me is is my thread to home so when he was saying that when my mom comes and visits she always asks what do you want i always want uh congas from kenya mm -hmm. uh, kenya or east africa and particularly congas because they are east african i have access to a whole lot of west african fabrics which i love um, and other Kitenge fabric, but I wanted these particular ones because it it resonated with me and and where I'm from. Explain what it is. So a, a conga is a uh, piece of fabric that uh, women collect. They're printed fabrics, and they have a proverb at the bottom of it, uh, kind of like a fortune cookie. When you open the fortune cookie, it has a different saying. Mm -hmm. The panel has a different um, saying on it. So women collect them because of the, the how pretty they are, their graphic, mm -hmm. and, and also for the message that they that they have at the bottom. And I call the fabric, or it's called, sometimes it is referred to as speaking clothes. So you can tell how, what a mood a woman is in because of the, the fabric at the bottom. Uh, I mean, the uh, proverb that's written on the bottom. Okay. Cater on what mood she's in or what uh, message she's trying to send out as she wears it. So, you know, Grace, uh, when you and I have chatted, you know, personally, one of the things that you um, referred to is the difference between a continental African and a diasporian African. Can you explain to our audience the difference in the two and how it manifests itself within the context of the New African Project? Okay, so uh, this is it. Is this it? No, it's on her end. Oh, okay. So uh, my definition of a, a, a continental African is uh, someone from the 54 countries on the continent of Africa. Okay. Um, and uh, Africans in the diaspora, out, everyone outside of, of uh, the continental African. So even though I refer to myself as a continental African, I realize I've also been living in the diaspora for the past uh, over 30 years. Okay. So. For this project, we were we were dealing with Africans outside of the continent. So those in the Caribbean, those in South America, those in Canada, Europe, Asia, 
everyone outside of the, the continent. So okay. those who have adapted and created their own identity outside of the continent. So you want to walk us through some of your images? Yes. Okay, awesome. All right. Here is our first image. Okay. So, um, so I don't know what to say about this image. Um, well, uh, I can, can I say something first? Mm -hmm. Sure. Powerful, mm -hmm. stunning, yes. fierce. Yes. Okay, you can take it from here. <laughs> okay, so um, most of the time I picked the women. Um, you did. And I was looking for a particular woman. I was looking for uh, women of all shapes and sizes. That's one. Um, I didn't want necessarily the hip hop model woman. I wasn't necessarily looking for her. I wasn't opposed to her, but I wanted all body shapes and sizes and and uh, hues, uh, skin tones to be reflected in in the project. Right. I wanted some of these women to feel powerful like your grandmother. Right. Okay. So, uh, you know, like most time, your grandmother is like the matriarch of the family. She has a lot of power. A lot of people listen to her, right? Mm -hmm. The family doesn't move without her. Mm -hmm. So I wanted that feeling from these women, right? So it's it's about strength, power, uh, regalness. It's about beauty. Um, and for some, we would say unconventional beauty, beauty right? Mm hmm we might say that. I don't say that. I just mm -hmm. think they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. But in the sense of, of our society, mm -hmm. uh, they don't fit a particular mold of standard of beauty, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show these women, you don't have to fit in that that mm -hmm. mold. That's not, you know, don't don't worry about that. You know what I'm saying? You're You're beautiful the way you are, right? And I wanted women who had children as well, because they're going to have scars, you know, and they're going to have uh, stretched skin sometimes. I wanted to show that these uh, wounds are are something to be proud of, mm -hmm. they're like battle scars, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so I was looking for all of that. Um, this young lady, um, I knew her from the music side. She's actually a singer. Okay. I love her, her, her look. I love the structure of her face, and I asked her would, it, would she participate, and she, she, she did. Now Grace did the uh, costuming, so Grace actually created everything that you see on her, mm -hmm. uh, except for the the wrap, the fabric. Mm -hmm. She did the makeup. Grace did the the hair. She did the neck piece. Um, sometimes we would both do like uh, the body art on particular models. Um, sometimes I would sketch out ideas and Grace would, you know, we would collaborate on what we wanted that particular model to look like. So, yeah. Now, were you using reference photos or was it, you know, a mixture of different ideas or your own creation? My own creation. But uh, the inspiration for the hairstyles, especially the threaded hairstyles, uh, when we first came to America, um, well, well, when we lived in Kenya before we came to the U.S., uh, threaded styles were really, really popular across the continent. And so it was literally art. It's, uh, hair is, is a form of art, is a signifier of like your sophistication, your, um, your expression, the expression of yourself. Right. So black hair, the way black people, African people around the world, what they do with their hair is... It's an art. It's a fine, fine art. So uh, I always remembered the threaded hairstyles. I used to, when my mom would get it done, uh, she would wear it for a few weeks and I would help her. I remember taking it down once as a little girl and seeing how they put the thing together. And so I always carried that with me. So when people think of something futuristic, I'm pulling from something that is, uh, it's contemporary. It, you, it, it, it has no timeline, even though the, those styles were done in the 70s. For me and this project, making it look futuristic, I, I just drew on um, a, an African hairstyle. 
So, you know, um, you know, having lived in Atlanta um, and anyone who lived in Atlanta, I would say like in, in the 90s, mm -hmm. the Bronner Brothers hair show was like the end all be all shut the city down. Yes. And how much do you uh, think that those kind of that ancestral DNA trans still manifests itself in how we are so particular about our hair? Yeah, it is. It is. I, 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 it's very apparent to me, mm -hmm. and especially when I moved to Atlanta from living, even when I lived in McLean, Virginia, we lived in the suburbs. But when sometimes on the weekends, my dad would take us into D.C., and driving around and you could see the way black girls expressed their hair, not just black girls, black men too. Mm -hmm. um, so when I came to Atlanta, I really got it. Riding the trains and seeing the sheer art of hair that was sculptured, like the pineapple, and it looked like a pineapple. Each mm -hmm. little piece of hair uh, moosed into place, sat under the dryer and then built up into a sculpture and girls were or the high right um, that the, the guys were wearing with the, the Gumby. Right. It was sculpture or the high top fade. And the lines and the hair. And then sometimes echoed in the eyebrow. Mm -hmm. you, you just can't beat it. You can't beat the creativity. So hair is as a, as a signifier and as a tool of expression uh, was a big thing um, in this project. And it was drawn from those experiences, what I see on the continent and what I see here. Okay, so let's go to the next image. Wow. Um, so again, this is another young lady that we know. We've known her for a long time. Um, I asked her to be a part of the project as well. And um, at first there's a little hesitation because it does require a lot of trust. Mm -hmm. One of the requirements is that the women all the models are are naked, you know, and we want to be able to build on your body. So once we see your body, uh, Grace may uh, draw some inspiration from whatever, right? Whatever she wants to accentuate, whatever, right? It could be your, your tone, it can be your shape, it could be uh, whatever, because we're trying to adorn your body, we're trying to make you look as beautiful and as powerful as we can. Mm -hmm. So um, once we got past the initial uh, jitters, I would say, she 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 did some really cool work with it. Yeah. No, I now, love this it. Piece. Uh, this is another piece that Grace created. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see it going around the shoulders, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, a piece around her waist as well. Mm -hmm. I love the structure of it, like it's just, Incredible. What is the material, Grace? Wood? Well, she can't tell you it's, what the materials are. It's, it's just are. wood. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to be going to be wood. Yes. So she's making this from scratch, y'all. This yes. is this isn't something that she's yeah, bought you can buy or out. modified. No. She no. she mm -hmm. created this. Right. Um, now, did you well, ever? I, I have a question uh -huh. for you guys. Did you ever? start out making a piece for one person and then said, you know what? I think where I was going with this for this person would actually look better on someone, you know, someone else that you were working with. Uh, not necessarily. I will make a piece and mm -hmm. uh, I'll put it on that model. The next model, I'll just use the same piece in a different way. Okay. Yeah. So the first piece, neck piece that you saw, uh, the young lady wearing with the, the spikes coming out of the neck, Mm -hmm. it worked so well. I know a few of the women. I, I put it on on, on them. Uh, bigger, small, taller, short. It just it reads differently on different bodies. So we can go to the next image. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So you're not seeing the full image, but yeah, that's uh, that's the now. You know, these pieces are going to be part of a show. Um, it's at the Hammond's House Museum in Atlanta. Uh, it's set to open. It's going to be a virtual open at first around May the 15th or so. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the date for right now. Uh, it was actually supposed to open on April the 3rd, but because of what's going on, we had to uh, postpone it. 
so the first opening is going to be a, a virtual opening and so it's not going to just be a showing of these photographs the photographs are then turned into mixed media pieces okay i think you have some examples we'll get to that later but you you'll see what i'm talking about so these are the actual photographs um this is another, another model um we liked her for her height and her uh her stature she was a, a solid woman she's it's actually tall. smaller now but yeah, um, tall, yeah I, I loved her physique mm -hmm. um, i loved her spirit actually Very much. um and she just came and did it you know we told her what we wanted and um she gave it to it you know it's in the eyes it's in the language um and and again there's another piece that grace created on, mm -hmm. on her on her shoulder mm -hmm. and even the uh, head piece is something yeah. grace created and and, and even the skirt yeah. um yeah. yeah but one thing that just you know in the the few images that we've seen so far that really just you know grabbed me is not only the power and the fierceness of the women that is emitting from within, mm -hmm. but also um, is the, the the femininity there as well. Like it's just such a beautiful balance between the two. Well, what I was trying to, when I was, what I want women to take away from it is the power that they have. Mm -hmm. And there is a power in being feminine mm -hmm. and in the feminine femininity mm -hmm. right so there is power there mm -hmm. she mm -hmm. is powerful mm -hmm. and and that's what i want to drill in her head right there's a lot of women they may look beautiful but they don't feel powerful yes. and a lot of them don't feel beautiful now i'm curious what was the reaction i know you said that um you know there's a degree of, of trust mm -hmm. you know with the women the models initially and as you were going through the process of transforming them, you know, physically, did you see their spirits, you know, because they felt like they were in a safe space? Did you see as you started to put on the costumes and doing the hair that, you know, that fierce empowerment just started oozing out of them? Most of them had never seen themselves that way. You know how as women, when we're putting on our makeup, we do it the same way. Mm -hmm. You get someone else who doesn't see how you do your makeup because, you know, you come without makeup, your hair, however, and then I'll work with, with the way it is. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, when they see how different they look, they've never, they've never, most of them have never seen it. Well, all of them have never seen themselves look like that, like that. And a lot of them wanted to leave the house like that mm -hmm. with, the, with the, however I had done mm -hmm. their hair because they wanted to hold on to that, how they felt. Now, for me, as a as a man, I can see the transformation. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, um, yeah, I I could definitely see it. the body language changes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I remember one time we were shooting a young lady, and Grace was actually making a piece for her as we as we were shooting. Okay. We put it on on her, then her whole stature right. changed. It sure did. And she, you know, her hair went up. Yes. And, mm -hmm whole posture change it, it was it was incredible to see that yeah, i've right? never seen that before and um and another thing that happened a couple of times actually um so usually what happens is we shoot in our living room we just clear the furniture move the furniture around put up a backdrop put up the lights and we shoot and so it's a hard shoot you know it may take an hour to three hours to do the shoot. Mm -hmm. and so you know usually when i'm done I go down to the basement and I start downloading or uploading the footage onto my drive. And so at, at this time, you can go change or take a shot, whatever you want to do, and say, hey, when you finish, just come downstairs and come look at your photo. Mm -hmm. So for most of the, my, all the models, I sent them some photos of someone else I shot to say, hey, this is kind of what we're doing, mm -hmm. you know, blah, blah, blah. And so this particular time, I told the young lady, when you're done, I'm downstairs and look at your photos. So I'm going through the photos already. She comes downstairs and she's looking at what I'm doing. She's like, oh, those are stunning. Those are those are beautiful. Those are great. She's like, yo, these are cool and all, but when are we going to get to my photos? And I was like, these are your photos. And uh, that, that, that really uh, stunned me that she didn't see herself that way. Mm -hmm. 
and um, actually kind of hurt my feelings too that she didn't see herself that way. Mm. So that happened. It happened a couple of times. But you realize that that's a that's a gift that you gave all of these, you know, already beautiful models that you gave them a gift, you know, in that moment, in that experience, um, to see themselves, to experience themselves to the next level. And it's something that they will always carry with them. And you immortalized it in an image. Right. Right. Yeah. So how did you did how did you create the vibe when you were actually doing going through the process of capturing the images? Was there a certain music or would you gauge it based upon you know the personality of the model? Uh yes. Um it was more of a mental thing than anything. Mm -hmm. so, so I would give them direction in the sense of I want you to feel like this. So uh, especially with the warrior poses, mm -hmm. I wanted them I wanted them to feel like if I approached them, they would tear my my head off. I wanted them to feel like they are nothing to mess with. They will literally you know, slash you, kill you, shoot you, stab you, whatever they had to do, mm -hmm. protect themselves and their loved ones, their loved ones mm -hmm. right? And so that's the feeling I wanted. So some people was able to get it like really quick. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I would have to tell them, well, give me the look that you would give your child, right? Without, mm -hmm. it, without verbalizing something. And then they automatically got it. Right. Um, that mama look. That mama look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I wanted to sort of pay homage to the warriors that we know. So there's a, what's the African uh, warrior we, we kept drawing reference from? Um, yeah, there's, there's a particular one. I forget her name. But then from Ghana? she's from Ghana. Yeah. And then, um, and then like, uh, even people like Harriet Tubman, you know, Absolutely. these were people that they, you know, she's a small woman, but you didn't play with her. Not at all. Right. You knew you was playing with your life if you played with her. Right. And so, you know, women are dangerous. They're not weaklings like that. They are dangerous mm -hmm. when they want to be. Right. And, that, and when they have to be. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show that in the work. And I wanted them to feel uh, mystical. Yes. Futuristic. I, wanted, I wanted them to feel futuristic. Mm -hmm. So some of the skin tone isn't, you know, real. Sometimes it has a bluish tint. To it sometimes have a, a purplish tint because I wanted to feel like the future. Mm -hmm. So then we started entering this notion of Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. right. right. So we started playing with that idea as well. Now this next image. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this is one of the first models we use actually. And um, same thing. We did this shoot with her and I changed it to a mixed media piece. So once the photograph was done, then I, I create another work of art from it. Right. So it's on it's actually on wood. Uh the stuff in the background is actually burned into the wood. It's silver leaf and uh there's painting on top of it as well. So um, you and, and this was actually called the Silver Sun Goddess, I think. Mm -hmm. So with this particular piece, you took one of the photo images and then you created a. This is one of the mixed media pieces as a part of the collection. Yes. Right. So okay. the show is probably going to look not exactly like this, mm -hmm. but more like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, our viewing audience definitely loves the, the work and the collection. Oh, thank you. So we'll go on to the, uh, um, actually, um, Grace, is this one of the Congo? Congas, yes. Congas? It is. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about um, Congas? So Congas uh, are mostly worn, well, you know, you can find them actually all over. Uh, I'll say East, Central, and Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. but the ones that I have, I have the ones from Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. And um, the reason why I was stuck on them, because it was a way of connecting me to home. 
So I'm a, I love textiles anyway, and I love African textiles in particular, but these particular ones, uh, these congas uh, coming from East Africa, um, now the, 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 the market for them has been threatened by uh, secondhand clothes and cheaper clothes from China. Mm. So uh, it's been shrunk down to probably um, 10,000 when it used to be used to employ at least 100, at least 100,000 people were employed in the, um, the making and printing and, and uh, uh, fashioning of these cotton um, congas. They're usually six foot, uh, uh, one panel is usually uh, three yards. And people usually, buy, women usually buy two of them, one to wrap your head and one to wrap your waist. Um, but the panels, I don't, I don't use, uh, I don't use mine. I, I save them. Um, and now I realize that it's going to be an archive because they're not that plentiful anymore. You can still get them, but it's not the same. Um, and how do you authenticate um, kind of the original traditional way of making it and one of the... Usually the printer will have his name on it. The same, okay. the same with Kitenge fabric or uh, other West African fabrics. The, the, the block, the printer will have their name on it. Okay. You know, there's a whole lot of Dutch fabric that's on the market now. Mm -hmm. uh, they are um, the ones who are printing a lot of African fabrics and they will have the Dutch wax on it. But the, uh, the first when I uh, used to collect African wax, it was West African and you could see the printer on the, on the hem of it. You can see who, who printed it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll go to the next image. Yeah, that one is called Silver War, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, same same concept. I wanted uh, this woman to to look kind of, for lack of better words, fierce. Yes. Um, and what's important, I guess, about the piece, if you if you look at it, um, so we often talk when we talk about power. Mm -hmm. uh, man is often talking about defying nature, right? So we hear things like uh, move mountains, right? Or, you know, people who are in the biblical stuff, they'll mm -hmm. say, you know, the uh, Moses mm -hmm. parted the sea, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. so what I wanted to show was when these women embrace their power, the earth will respect them and the plants and vegetations will move according to their movement. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're seeing on the side. Mm -hmm. So it's like if I move, everything moves mm -hmm. because that's that's how I'm feeling. I'm feeling that powerful. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was trying to show in, in this particular piece. Now, is that the Afro futurism kind of aspect to it? Yes. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, when you think about um, kind of like, you know, superhero movies, yeah. that there's there's always some character that you know, using the natural elements as his or her, you know, superpower, you know, the earth, the, you know, wind and, and you know, rain or thunder, et cetera. But she definitely seems like she's in full control and massing her energy. Mm -hmm. right, right. And then firmly placed in the future, because a lot of times uh, when we would see science fiction movies, we wouldn't see black people. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is a firm, a way to affirm that she's going to be there mm -hmm. in the in the in the future. She's been there in the past, the present, the future. And in fact, we all we all start with her. Yeah. So the hair design is that um, a take off of a traditional hair design or a Queen Grace original? It's a it's a it's a Queen Grace adaptation of an original design. Okay. Uh, I grew up with these threaded hairstyles, so people would really construct this, all kinds of sculpture with with that. So of course, mine might be exaggerated because of what we're trying to do here, but I'm sure I could find reference for a threaded style that looks exactly like that. So in the upper torso, is that body paint or is that another sculpture piece? Uh, that's no, funny. that's actually, uh, so that's actually part of the mixed media. So mm -hmm. I think I painted that on her body. Oh, okay. So what's interesting about it is it starts off with body painting, mm -hmm. photography, mm -hmm. and then sometimes painted again. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
guys are just so bad. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, I really, really enjoyed doing this. Like every woman that came as a collaborator just contributed something beautiful. I mean, these pieces are stunning on their own in each element. Like, you know, I could just stare at her hair and just be like, oh, wow. Like, I love, you know, the symmetry of it all. Um, it seems like she's emitting more power from her, from her hair. But then, you know, her pose. And it's like, and then with the mixed media on the side, it seems like she's doing this, this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you see the, what I thought was the body piece. And I'm like, oh, that's a hot bustier kind of take on it. Um, but the fact that you, you know, you painted it on, but it, you know, again, her stance is very powerful, but yet, you know, there's this whole femininity about it. And then the costuming grace is just bananas. Mm -hmm. bananas. I don't know how else to describe it, but bananas. <laughs> it's so much fun. It's like creating a living sculpture. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We didn't even see the bottom part um, because of the cropping. Mm -hmm. You burned that in. Yeah, so that's all burned in. It's supposed to be the ground and roots in the ground. Mm -hmm. But again, that kind of Afrofuturism, you know, almost like uh, how you see a computer motherboard with, you know, the connectivity, to me, that gives it that futuristic aspect to it. Mm -hmm. All right. The goddess herself. Tell us more. Tell us more. <laughs> Again, I wanted these women to feel like goddesses or gods mm -hmm. or, or, or a deity of some sort. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's what I wanted it to feel like. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at the pose and her hair and her features in the face, like the high cheekbones and everything, um, I mean, it. it it says everything to me. I mean, um, she looks like she's levitating. Yeah, she she does. She looks like she's levitating. Um, but again, this is about how this is this is our version of celebrating and worshiping black women. Mm -hmm. um, the, their bodies, their personalities, their, their person, spirit. their spirit. Mm -hmm their power, um, their looks, everything. This is what the project is about. And you can just, I mean, I can just imagine her in a room and just really pulling everybody and all the energy into her mm -hmm. um, because it just has such presence. She has such presence. Very much. So again, this is, um, the original Queen Grace hairstyle, but then also using some of the other um, sculptural elements that you've had in some of the other images. Yes. Okay. I'm gonna start at the, the top, so we can see the very top. Yes. Tell us more, tell us more. Uh, Grace, you can, you can talk okay. about this. this. So this one, I wanted, when I, when I started making these, uh, the chest piece, um, I w wanted it, I wanted, it was so big, I wanted to balance it out with another piece on her head. Mm -hmm. So not a conventional crown, not her hair as a crown, her, her hair is already a crown, but something that looks like antlers. Mm -hmm. So you know when a reindeer or um, elk, elk exactly have those big those big antlers on their heads, and that is can be used as a weapon as well. So it gives it something uh, that um, draws from nature, but on a human being it looks futuristic, abstract. So I I, I did love the abstract part of this this particular this particular piece very much like a warrior very much mm -hmm. that's exactly what we're very doing. much yeah <laughs> oh that's what it's called 
Yeah. But that's, and then that's indigenous what we're for. indigenous people around the world mm-hmm. will take on uh when they have uh you they will take on using horns, mm-hmm. uh horns and all that. So when I have a bull's horns on a head, then I have the spirit of that bull when I go into war. So that's the same thing with it with this. When I have these when you see a buck, uh, you know, with the full antlers, it it is so impressive. Mm-hmm. He exudes that in this in this pose with this costuming, and then also the makeup too. Yeah, and the the contrast between kind of like the black and white image, but then the, the full color um, makeup. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah and it was also- fun to do. It was fun to do. It wasn't. I, I didn't want it to be conventional where all the makeup goes on the eyelid because it's eyeshadow. Mm-hmm. Use it all over the face. It doesn't have to be just on the eyes. And then again, body paint here, or was this a mixed media? Uh, actually, that's uh, her tattoo. Oh, okay, her original art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's just the way I edited it, where I pulled that out. Mm-hmm. Now, is that um, does she have also a tattoo on her hand as well? Uh, I think she does. I think she does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. And I love how the how you pull the tattoo out and how it kind of um, not mimics, but it's it's enhanced by the face makeup in that same kind of color palette. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the costuming, Grace. And the costuming, uh, I used fabric for the apron, um, and I can't tell you what I made the chest piece and the headpiece out of. <laughs> yes, we have to keep our secrets. We do. We do. <laughs> Um, but yeah, just mixed media. So a lot of times I'll use uh, just ordinary things, things that you would find at the dollar store, at Home Depot, at um, at Goodwill, uh, fabric, and, and then I will use a lot, of, a lot of fabric actually to construct um, these costumes. Well, um, there was a comment from our audience about her fist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was that instinctive on her part, or was that a creative artistic direction? Uh, it's, it's, it's both. So Mm -hmm. again, um, you know, so you, you're sort of like a director sometimes as as a photographer, Mm -hmm. having to explain to them the stance, how the fists actually look, but sometimes women don't hold their fists right when they're like doing this fighting pose. Right. Uh So, um, you know, she was, she, she just kind of knew what to do. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. She's a, a feisty young lady. She, is. <laughs> yeah. she was nice with her hands, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she knew. She knew what she was doing. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're gonna go to the next image. Yeah. yeah this this, this young lady. Uh, she's actually a photographer herself. Okay. Um, and um, I asked her to be now. I don't know if she wants me to say this, but. Uh, I asked her to be a part of the project, and she looked at me. She's like, "Look, now, um, I'm I'm not a small woman, mm-hmm. like exactly. Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes. It's like exactly. I want you just the way you are. I think you're perfect. Right. So she came, and uh, she came with this big red afro yeah. that we lit. You know, made it kind of look uh, yellow orange." Mm-hmm. I just kind of played with the skin tone. And uh, she gave us some beautiful images. She really did. She was also one of the first ones in the, uh, yeah. that we shot over eight years ago, nine years ago. Mm-hmm. And there's so many things of, about it. Because at first, you know, it wasn't until you said she came in with her own afro. I thought that was another kind of, mm-hmm. you know, enhancement because the her hair color is the same as we're definitely the same as the, is this another one of the the special um no i didn't edit it special so sometimes what we would do is we i, I would ask grace to bring down some uh the fabrics the wraps mm-hmm. sometimes go through two or three mm-hmm. and then get to the one we thought matched the particular model or the feeling that we wanted okay. so we we came to this one and we stuck with this one. Right. And sometimes we would place the uh, the wrap higher or lower on the body to mm-hmm. see what it 
with it with enhance. Mm -hmm. Um, we just tried everything. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it makes them look taller, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. elongate the torso, or if they have a long torso, we can raise it up. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the leeway to raise it up and make her look taller uh, based on the placement. Mm -hmm. So the red was, we uh, used a variegated um, gold on her chest. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that uh, in hat, well, spoke, uh, worked in tandem with the hair and the, and the kanga. So, same thing here. Um, she's actually from Suriname. Okay. So that's all. Since we're, we're looking for women from all the places in the previous model, they're from. She's from Guyana. Okay. And we have some other models that are from Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and they, you know, it says what we wanted to say as far as look at all these Africans all over the world. True. Well, you know, the thing about the images uh, or the models, all their faces look familiar to me. Yeah. You know, they look like, you know, someone else that I know uh, or just in their facial expressions. I'm like, oh, that reminds me of, you know, so and so and so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's familiar. Oh, wow. Okay, you can talk all day about this one. Very, very much, very much. Uh, so I made the the helmet and the I would I guess I would call it uh, like some kind of armor shoulder, like an epaulet of some sort. Mm -hmm. It has a military feel to it. Um, and then I used these uh, this glitter to make put the dots on her on her chest all the way her, down her abdomen. Uh, gold paint on her neck, and then Maurice uh, painted the her chin. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then I, I made the, the skirt out of fabric. Now there's so many things that I, I don't know where to start with on this, on this image. Mm -hmm. um, her hand placement, the, the head piece and the torso piece is just like, you know, it's just mind, mind blowing. But then she looks introspective mm -hmm. as well as like, um, I don't want to say calculating, but like she seems determined like in the facial expression. And then the hands, mm -hmm. like, okay, so walk us, walk us through, please. And I know you don't want to reveal any trade secrets on the, on the technical creation, yes. but maybe from the inspirational side. Uh, again, um, now she was, she is a model, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so she she's a model in real life and we've known her for a while and she knew about the project and she asked, could she be a part of it? Mm -hmm. And I was like, of course, I would love for her to be a part mm -hmm. of it. And so mm -hmm. she came and did it. Um, and it was, girl. it was pretty, pretty easy shoot to do because again, she's a model, she knows her body. And again, you just give them the story and she's able to act it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, um, so yeah, so even, we, you know, the hard thing about the the modeling is you're modeling from head to toe. Mm -hmm. So you're not seeing the whole photo, but yeah. so the fingers, how you're holding the fingers yes. is conveying whether you're getting ready to fight mm -hmm. or defend yourself mm -hmm. or whatever, right? So, that's why the fingers were important, mm -hmm. right? Um, so even the curve of her torso. The curve, yeah. So you know, I mean, I love the the photo. Right. I I think she's a great model. Yeah. Um, but again, what was cool is she knew exactly what we was trying to go for, mm -hmm. and um, I think we got it. You know. Right. Okay, you got it. Plus some. <laughs> And some of them look like they're moving without moving. To me, she looks like she's moving without. Because mm -hmm. I, I was, like I said, the curve in her torso, um, the turn of her her head, and she looks like, to me, looks like she's surveying. Mm. Seen either before or after battle. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the, the skirting of the wrap. Mm -hmm. You know, just the contrast between, you know, the, the structure piece 
Yes. At the top and then the soft movement at the bottom. Yes, because you got to be able to move. Mm. That's right. <laughs> Hips mm. don't lie. <laughs> yeah, protect your head and shoulders. <laughs> and, uh, and then you got to be able to move, be agile. Mm -hmm. Now, the makeup um, color selection to also pick up the colors in, this, in the, the, the skirt or the wrap? Not necessarily. I just loved the pop of red because it's really, really red. Um, and it contrasts with, with the headpiece and the shoulder piece. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was, I was thinking of. Now, in, in edit, Maurice can, can manipulate the colors. I don't know what else to say about this collection other than when are we going to be able to see it in this full manifestation? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's always evolving. So like I said, the first thing that we was going to do was, uh, is, is with the Hammond's House Museum. Okay. Again, it's going to be a virtual opening yes. um, on, uh, I think, May the 15th. Yes. Um, at that show, you will we'll be there. We'll go through all the pieces. We'll show the pieces, what they are, what they mean, what's the inspiration, blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. Be able, to, be able to see that, right? And then I think we're going to go for a strong closing for the show. Okay. Um, we'll have artist talks as well. Mm -hmm. so it, it might be an artist talk, um, maybe during the show or maybe a little later. Yeah. So um, it's going to be up. We have other kind of programming going on, mm -hmm. dealing with the show as well. Mm -hmm. um, we had a performance that we was going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, with the music that was created for the project. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, video. So, you know, some of the models, we did um, video projects with them. Okay. Um, so I had one model uh, dance to some music that I created for the project. Oh, wait, you didn't tell me you created music too. Yeah, that's what, yeah. That's what I'm saying, yeah. you know. So what's cool about the project, it, it, it allows us to use everything that we love to do. So mm -hmm. the photography, mm -hmm. the makeup, mm -hmm. the, painting. the painting, the yeah. body painting, yes. the um, costuming, costuming the mm -hmm. everything. So it encompasses every, everything. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not a staff of folks, it's just us two. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you are a force, so. Right. Well, there, there are, in this, in this image, there are two photographers one yeah. filmmaker, one second camera, two painters, mm -hmm. two sculptors, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, what yeah, but also, but also I'm, a, I'm a movement by myself, but I'm a force when we're together. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and then in the in the, the most the important piece is that this is a real collaboration between really us and, and, and the models. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very much. So yeah, they're they're we, much we a part of the process it. as well. We couldn't have done it without. Mm -hmm. So as you were you know, creating each image, each element, you know, of, you know, each of the model experiences and then also the mixed media pieces. Did you ever have kind of a, a personal reflective moment of, oh man, I remember the first time, you know, I did a headpiece and what it looked like, but now, you know, over time, I'm able to do like so much more. Much. And is. we're creating, you know, these different elements as well as the, you know, the final piece with each of the models, was it also a personal reflective moment during the, for you individually, um, during the process? Definitely. For me, the process for me starts with when, when the women walk in and mm -hmm. they sit down with me. So my uh, practice of when I used to braid hair and a woman, it's an intimate uh, moment. You sit with a woman and you get to know them. They get to know me. We get to exchange uh, stories and ideas of our path as womanhood. I, I learned about womanhood in the braiding circle because I used to braid women from a two-year-old to an 80-year-old. Mm -hmm. We always came out with something. So the same with this process, sitting with these women, hearing their stories. Um, they were inspiring. Uh, we traded uh, recipes. Uh, what we did for our hair, how we looked after our children, how we educate them, how do we handle children on the spectrum, how do we have children with special needs, how do we look after our elderly parents, um, all of those things. Mm -hmm. so it, the process is takes about two to three hours to do your hair and makeup. And so we're sitting, talking, we're not just sitting quietly, 
because they want to know who are you and I'm, I want to know who they are. And so it establishes, the process establishes an intimacy between the three of us because we went through something together and created something stunning together. You know, one thing that I always um, admired about both of you was your, the way that you interact with your community and your sense of community. Um, not only, you know, community of artists, but, you know, community of buyers, community of friends. And, you know, when I saw the first few images of, of this particular um, project of the both of you, I just personally saw it as another manifestation of, you know, Maurice and Grace, your sense of community and what you do and how you, you just kind of bring it all, bring everyone together and supporting you know us individually as well as a, a collective mm -hmm. yeah. so what is your hopes and desires as to how this is um this project will be received by the viewing audience i just want people to celebrate as well as willie celebrate with me the beauty of what i've witnessed what i've been able to be a part of um how they've edified my life because some of these pieces are around the house with me. So I get to look at look at them and marvel at, at their beauty. Some of the things I didn't see initially when I when we shot, because Maurice has thousands of images, some of them I've never seen until he prints them out. Okay. Right. So it's always a new sense of wonder mm -hmm. how beautiful that was. So here's um well Maurice, what is your your opinion on how you would like uh, the project to be received? Mm. I hate, I, I'm yeah, not trying I to can't. sound, I don't want to sound try, like I'm trying to be deep or nothing, but mm -hmm. I want the, I want women to take uh, something from the project more than anything. I want them to understand that uh, no one else has, uh, can define them. They define themselves. Mm -hmm. and, um, you don't have to be held by anybody else's standard. Um, you know, because we're always seeing black women being attacked in, in media. So we, we watched the whole, all these women being attacked for their hair, right? Mm -hmm. um, hold up, what's up? Leatrice is saying something. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, but, you know, make sure that you the exhibit gets all that it's deserved, May 15th through August 30th. Um, at the Hammond House. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks, Leatrice. Thank you. But um, oh, you know, it's like, it's like, how do you make sure your little girl grows up with self-esteem? Mm -hmm. How do you get your little girl to grow up feeling like she can be and do anything that she wants to do? Mm -hmm. Right. That's the feeling that I want women women to take away from the project. Right. So even the body image, I don't have to be this size to be beautiful, right? I'm beautiful the way I am. Or if I don't like the way I am, I have the power to change it, right? Mm -hmm. Not through uh, surgery and stuff like that, you know, through, you know, eating properly, exercising, you can do that if you want to, right? Mm -hmm. um, but as long as you're healthy, you don't have to be this way, you know what I'm saying? And you'll find people that love you that way. Mm -hmm. But so you can't listen to the media. They'll tell you that if you're not light skinned and curly hair and green eyes, then you're not beautiful. That's just not true. Mm. And, uh, you know. But we also have women that look like that in our, in our, right. uh, in our story because they're part of the story of, of women in the diaspora, African American right. women. Right. I'm not saying someone's not, I'm saying they all are. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. Right. Now, often yes. oftentimes Trying we get we get right. the we get that that um message that only these only are the ones. desirable ones. Right. Mm -hmm. Hell I remember one time I'm sitting with another artist uh 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 he's a he's a French artist and we was talking about some women, you know, some celebrity women and he liked this particular woman and he I said, like, Well why do you like her? Right. Mm -hmm. like, well, I think she's beautiful. I said, what makes her beautiful? He said, it's the white in her. 
-hmm. Right. He said that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, are you serious? Because the, the, the woman he was talking about was a mixed woman, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I can see that being reflected in our community mm -hmm. where people felt like the woman that the ambiguous woman was the standard of beauty. We couldn't tell what she was, right? right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, that sucks. Why, why are we putting that out there? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, the light skin, you know, in my family, my father's light skin, my mother was dark skin, and I'm in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I don't have those color complexes like everybody else. I love them all in, in every shade, the full spectrum. <laughs> yes, exactly. I can find it. I can find beauty in all of it, right? So it just saddens me that we make it seem like only this type of woman is desirable. Mm -hmm. And the effects of that is damaging. Right. So to me, the only way is to to counter off of that. Say no. Well, for every for everyone that's just saying it's not here, ten others that are. Mm-hmm. And the ability, just like, you know, and me viewing your images, seeing people or, you know, resemblances of women that I that I know. Right. But for, you know, especially our young girls to be able to see reflections of themselves, reflections of other women, you know, in their lives and to see them powerful and fierce and strong and, you know, focused and determined and all those, you know, positive attributes, which you know, only instills their their value and their sense of worth. But there's so many lessons we learn doing the project. So uh, uh, one friend wanted to participate and she has a, a, a daughter, I think at the time, what was she, nine, eight, nine, something like mm -hmm. that. And so she's like, listen, I want to do your project, but, you know, I don't know if I should bring my daughter with me. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, you should bring her. Mm -hmm. She's like, are you serious? I said, yes. So this is a time she can see that, hey, she can be proud of her body. Mm -hmm. And just because you're naked doesn't mean it's lewd, it's lewd mm -hmm. or it's something to be ashamed of mm -hmm. or that it has anything to do with sex. Mm -hmm. Right. So so the daughter, so she brings, she comes by, she brings the daughter. Now it's time for her to disrobe so we can do the body makeup and everything. The daughter immediately was she was shaken by that. She didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. and I was like, hey, just relax. It's okay. We're just going to paint, paint your mom. It's going to be okay. And after a while, she settled down. She settled down because she saw that we weren't freaking out. Right. right? And so then we start to go do the shoot. Now, halfway in the shoot, now she's telling her mom how to yes. pose. <laughs> do like this, mommy, and do like that, mommy. And I was like, exactly. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. not scaring these children about their bodies. Right. You know what I'm saying? You know, she's a young lady. She's going to grow up into a woman. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And she still should be respected because yes. I'm the man in this situation. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing anything disrespectful to her mother because she's naked. Right. So to me, there was a lesson in, hey, no matter... What's going on? I should be respected. Right. And I should respect myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So how was the little girl's um, reception to seeing her mom and, you know, the costumes and these powerful poses? Oh, she, she loved she it. That's loved, what I'm saying. She so she started looking at it like it was dress up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You also could see how beautiful her mom looked. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And she had never seen her mom like that. Before. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was fine. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, and those kind of it, those kind of experiences are so um, powerful and just lasting in you know a child's memory and for the parent too to see, to see their especially their daughter's reaction for a mother to see their daughter's reaction you know to something that they're that they're doing um, I remember uh, well Maurice and Grace have known my daughter since she was five. <laughs> And um, I remember in Central Park, we did this, you know, activity it was like a girls empowerment activity where you had to climb this mobile wall. And so I got all the way up to the top and my daughter was climbing, you know, climbing up. But, you know, she started getting like a little afraid. And I said, you know, I'm up here. Come on. Like, you can do this. And just kind of really just encouraging her during this process. But then when we got down, she said, Mom, you were so brave. 
And like I, everything in me was just like, oh. yeah. just to have her think that I was brave, yeah. but also knowing that if I did it, she can do it too. And being that, you know, example. And there is a lot of power in your images because, you know, Maurice, your natural mystic painting, uh, my daughter Aressa, and like when it was here in our gallery, she just gravitated to that because she saw so much of herself mm -hmm. in that painting. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what you guys have done with this new African project is not only spectacular from an artistic standpoint, but it's so culturally relevant and, and necessary mm -hmm. um, for women of all generations, and really not just women, but men also, um, and you know the world to be able to see it. So I'm glad Atlanta is going to be the first host yes. of the project. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That there, there are going to be worldwide receptions and locations that this project will um, be housed um, all over the world because it it is it is necessary. I believe it. I think so. I really do. Yeah. So one of my dreams is to see this project on the continent. I don't anywhere on the continent, so they can see their brothers and sisters out in the world, you know, out in the diaspora, and what they produce in connection with with home. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have this in Nairobi. So we're, we're going to claim Thanks. that right now. Yes, for sure. <laughs> And we're going to try to get it here in the Northeast as well. Yes. And, um, you know, I just think that, again, it's it's so necessary. It's, it's actually a requirement mm -hmm. to be able to show our, our connection mm -hmm. and to let the continent know that all has not been lost within us mm -hmm. and that, that cultural DNA is still, is still pumping through our veins and in our mindset and in our spirit. Right. Yeah. And, and, over the over the years that we've been um, separated by that ocean, there has been cross pollination going on all through these years. This is not new. Uh, absolutely. So my last set of questions for you is regarding you know this stay home status that you know not only the majority of the U.S. but really the whole world is under right now. And you know when we look back on time when there's you know, throughout history when there's been some kind of major, you know, event that has been, you know, disruptive in one way or another um, to society. It's always been the artists and the artisans that have been able to reflect the mood and um, the mindset, um, you know, of, you know, the residents of that particular area or the community, you know, culture. How would you, this is two parts, do you plan to use, you know, your feelings during this time to create? Um, and what do you challenge of other um, creatives to do to reflect this time? Well, well <laughs> in our studios in our home, we, we just continue to work. Mm -hmm. So once the order, um, a stay at home order uh, was, was put out, we work from home anyway, so we just we just continued on. We j we'll just <laughs> working on the uh, and then the this is a mask that I, I made us some masks uh, out of uh, some fabric that I had my mom sent me. Uh, so I decided to make some custom masks for us. <laughs> In between creating, uh, you know, expanding on the, the the costuming part of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to create new pieces for um, to be hung or uh, displayed during uh, with within the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So would you say that this time for you really hasn't been that disruptive because of the fact that you work from home? Yeah, it, as far as the work aspect of it, no, it is no. Maurice, masked one. <laughs> like uh, what's the Mexican uh, wrestlers? <laughs> what was the name? What's the name? What is? Uh, I forget what you call them. I, I love those them. masks. Yeah, I'm, I love I'm, I'm gonna get one of those one day. You got one. Was yeah. it Lucho Libre? No. Yes, Nacho Libre. Yeah. That's it, Nacho Libre. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you, are you asking how's it how's it affected us? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. How has it affected you? And do you plan on taking? 
you know, your thoughts and your feelings during this time and, you know, being able to express yourself, you know, your feelings into some type of art? I don't know. Maybe eventually it'll work its way into something. You know what I'm saying? I, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to do the obvious, you know, do a painting with somebody with a mask on. Right. Um, I'm not knocking anyone who's done that already. Right, I'm just right. saying I, I, I didn't feel inspired. Disclaimer. <laughs> I'm not knocking anyone because I've mm-hmm. actually seen some pretty cool pieces like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I just for myself didn't want to do it yet. Um, nah, I mean, we're, we're focused already. So, you know, we work from home. So we, we're kind of isolated anyway. You know what I'm saying? We're always working from home. Um, the only hard part was not being able to just go out and get something that I may need from the art supply store or something like that. Right. Or even food, even because sometimes we're so busy, we don't have time to cook. But mm-hmm. now you're you're forced to do your cooking and stuff like that. So um hasn't it really it hasn't been bad. Actually. Hasn't been a bad thing yeah. at, at all. It hasn't mm-hmm. um the only you know it's it's a concerning thing because mm-hmm. uh unfortunately I do know some people who've been directly affected by uh, what's going on with the virus mm-hmm. and uh, actually gotten sick and lost, and, and lost some family members. So um, that's real. That's, you know, that's affected me um, uh, emotionally, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? And trying to use your work to keep yourself out of that space. Mm-hmm. So we're always uh, getting that in the news. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get it online. Mm-hmm. We get the conspiracy theories. We get the speeches. We don't know who's lying, who's telling the truth. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. You know what I'm saying? Right. So we, we, um, that can take a toll on you if you're not focused on something else. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's. You know, there's something, you know, we, we've talked about this, you know, offline that, um, you know, I myself am not uh, an artist. I, I live with an artist you know, I'm surrounded by artists and there's something really special that us non-artists can learn from artists because I love how my husband is able to kind of disappear and find balance and peace when he's sketching and drawing Mm -hmm. and being able, the ability to kind of turn off the rest of the world in order to be able to kind of focus on sketching and just you know, I, I feel like it's almost a form of meditation um, in the sense that you're able to kind of turn off the rest of the world and be able to disappear in this, in, in the art, because, you know, all, as you said, you know, we're getting it from TV. You know, if you're watching TV, every commercial is, you know, you know, brands have changed their commercials to talk about, you know, impact of isolation, the virus, being home. Right. Um, defer your car payments, like all this stuff where it's like you can't even disappear into like a regular network television show without constantly being reminded of what's going on. And then you got the news, you get on social media, everybody's talking about it. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, there have been lives lost of, you know, people that we know, people we may know personally, and all of that can be all consuming. But I really admire how artists are able to turn down the volume of the outside world and be able to, you know, meditate with their art. It's true. Yeah. I mean, you kind of return it to your roots Mm because I I think that everybody's creative. Right. I think it's within us all. I think some of us practice more than others. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's just how I feel. But, um, and some people use it for meditation. I think Grace does. Mm -hmm. I I use it as a, as, you know, an escape, I guess is, form of meditation but it's more of a, an escape for me i like i do like to get lost in some sort of creative uh form so sometimes it's music okay so i'll have music going on while i'm painting you know that helps me uh, just kind of get in my own world you know what i'm saying but you know it's also an opportunity to take those feelings and turn it into art because mm-hmm. that's what you do you take mm-hmm. those emotions and you use it, you use the energy from it and create something uh, that speaks to something. Right. You know? um, so the next, your, your next TED talk would be on, you know, <laughs> how the, the non-artisan can, 
you know, channel their emotions into some kind of creativity. Right. And um, art should be part of, go back uh, to be part of the school curriculum. So art and music needs to, needs to be back because it gives kids, uh, kids are really easy at, at accessing their creativity. Mm -hmm. Give them the paper and a crayon and they'll, they'll go to it. But then at some point people start to say, well, I can't draw. And I'm like, I know you can because you learned to write the alphabet. You learned how to draw. You can. Just exactly. be good. And don't be hard on yourself thinking that we got to this point being able to draw. We started drawing just like you, those letters, the A, B, C. And then the thing with us is we continue to do it. You know, there's a beautiful, um, wonderful place that exists right across the street um, from our art gallery called uh, Crafty Fox. And they work with a lot of young kids um, on, you know, craft projects. But the owner's mentality is that, you know, here there are no mistakes. If that's what you want it to look like, that's what, it, that's what it's going to look like. But their mindset is we're trying to create a, a, a next generation of creative thinkers kids who are, are being innovative and creative in you know, the way that they look at problems. And you know, I love them for that because we need that next generation. Um, we need that next generation of innovative, creative thinkers. Well, there you go. That's the importance of art is, uh, is being able to think creatively and um, problem solving. You said Truly. it, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's what art is. You know, once you, once you immerse yourself into it, it is about solving problems, right? It is about imagining a new possibility. Truly. So that's the importance of it. And you, and then it does force you to be a critical thinker, mm -hmm. right? And so we don't, we don't have enough of that. You know? uh, and I think because people kill that spirit of it, uh, they don't see, they don't see the value in art until they need it. You know what I'm saying? So just like what we're going through now, you're relying on artists, to right? Carry to carry you through. So whether it's the DJ, the literature, or, 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 or the movies. literature, right? Mm -hmm. the movies or art, all the art talks that are going on. Yes. Now we're back to to art again. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's the importance of it, you know. So yeah, I agree with you. That's that's cool that they're doing that. Well, we're going to close out church <laughs> on that note <laughs> because that is really a powerful moment in our in our greatest time of need. It has been art that has sustained us. Mm -hmm. So we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And King Maurice for um, sharing your visual beauty and your inner beauty with us. Um, we can't wait to um, you know, see the visual tour and then actually um, experience it once you know, the world opens back up on the New Africans uh, exhibition. We will be sure to include it um, on our website, um, the links when it becomes available and on our social media pages. And again, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your talents. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for, for having us and thinking about us and, yes. and uh, exposing people to us. Yes. And uh, thank you, Chris, for the technical yes. things that you're doing behind the scenes that nobody knows you're doing back there. Yes. Appreciate right. it. He's my rock. <laughs> thank you so much. I love you guys. We love you too. Okay, thanks everybody for um, viewing. Uh, thanks for your, your comments. Um, we, we, we love you too, because if there wasn't an audience, then we'd be sitting here talking to ourselves, but that's all right too. <laughs> I see some of the models that are out there that participated, tell them I said thank you. And yes, I see uh, Rodney and Cheryl and the uh, whole crew out there. Yes. Thank y'all. Dan Henry. Yes. Yeah. Sue Ross. All right. Well, thank you, and we'll see you soon. All right. Okay. Bye-bye.